workshop taught chemistry. Over to you. Thanks. So, good morning, everyone. So, um, I heard that apatite is going uh, trendy. So, I'm going to talk about how we can use apatite to trace magmatic processes in mafic layered intrusions. So, this is part of my PhD work with Sarah Dare and uh, under, with the collaboration of Olivier Namur and Eduardo Monceau. So um, we already know that apatite chemistry can be used to trace its geological environment of formation and to trace differentiation. Uh, by the way, little publicity, so I'm talking more about this in my poster. And in this presentation, I will show you using new apatite data and compilation data that apatite Apatite chemistry can also be used to trace all these, these processes, so crystal contamination, magma mixing, or if apatite can crystallize, crystallize this from a mafic or a felsic melt. So why mafic layered intrusions? So the intrusions I will be uh, using all formed in a similar context, meaning they were formed in large igneous provinces from mantle-derived melts, so at high degrees of partial melting. Even these intrusions were formed in a similar context. They have variable parameters. So the composition of the primary, primary melts can vary depending on the depth of partial melting, oxygen fugacity, and apatite saturation can occur at different times um, at, uh, during the crystallization history. So in the following presentation, I will classify my intrusions into two types, the ones in gray and the one in green. The samples in gray correspond to apatite from olive, olivine and clanopyroxene dominated intrusions. So there is negligible crystal contamination, such as in Skergard, Setil, or Ronge, or there is contamination with a calcareous component, such as Tehe and Pandra. On the other hand, the orthopyroxene dominated intrusions correspond to, contam um, to intrusions that underwent contamination with a silic silicic crust. So as you all know, the Beaujolais complex, and I also added the Sudbury igneous complex because it's a purely crystal melt. So now let's talk about apatite. Apatite can, um, can be found in two forms. So as a cumulus apatite or intercumulus apatite, and it can be related or not to mineralization. So first, cumulus apatite. Here I use the example of Satil intrusive suite in Quebec, Canada. And the intrusion can, um, is decomposed into uh, three megacyclic units, and cumulus apatite occurs at the top of two of the megacyclic units. At the top of MC1, cumulus apatite um, is in unmineralized layers because there is less than 8% of apatite. But at the top of MCU2, namely the critical zone, there can be up to 30% apatite. So it's nelsonite, and it's uh, mineralized in iron, titanium, and phosphorus. Now, for intercumulus apatite, it's, it's apatite that crystallize from a uh, trapped liquid from interstitial melts. And here I use the example of the Bougevel complex. So, as you can see, apatite is interstitial. And in the bottom of the Bougevel complex, it can be associated with uh, nickel, copper, or PG mineralization. But towards the top, it's not associated with any mineralization. So what you need to remember is that there is cumulus and intercumulus apatite, and that both of them can be associated or not with mineralization. So uh, before talking about apatite, uh, uh, um, apatite to trace magmatic processes, we you all know that whole work can record several processes, such as crustal contamination, depth of partial melting, fractional crystallization of plagioclase, and also magma mixing. And in the following presentation, I will show you that apatite chemistry can record all these processes and also the timing of apatite saturation, if apatite can crystallize from a mafic or a felsic melt. So let's start with crystal contamination. I will use this diagram. So it's the light, light reverse ratio and heavy reverse ratio. So in red, in each quadrant here, you can see the slope of the light reverse and heavy reverse in apatite. So first, let's have a look at the samples in gray. So um, it's samples from intrusions where crystal contamination is negligible. And as you can see, they all share a, li um, a low uh, light reverse ratio. And if you look at the other samples on the right here, they correspond to intrusions that underwent contamination with a silicic crust. And they have a higher lanthanum over neodymium ratio. 
So using this ratio, you can, you, we can say, uh, we can trace crystal contamination. And to be sure of this, we compare this ratio with um, incompatible elements that were normally concentrated in the crust. And there is also a high thorium, uranium, lead, or arsenic content in apatite that have a high lanthanum over neodymium ratio. And in order to be uh, more sure, we also used strontium uh, isotopes in apatite. So first here is just to show you that there is um, an evolution of the strontium initial in, uh, um, um, in the earth with, uh, uh, with age. So what you need to remember from this is that if your samples plot close to this line, it means that there is no crystal contamination. However, if there is a higher strontium initial, then your samples, um, then there will be, there, there would have been crystal contamination. So as an example here, there is a Sudbury and Bougevel complex. So as I said, we correlated this uh, strontium uh, isot this transform initial ratio with um, lanthanum over neodymium ratio in apatite, and you see that higher ratio corresponds to samples where there is crystal contamination. Using the same diagram, we can also talk about the depth of partial melting. So samples in gray here corresponds to um, um, a deep partial melting of the parental melt. Why do we know this? It's because uh, those samples correspond to um, the emission intrusions, where we know the parental melt has a deep picritic pre pre source. And on the, on the opposite here, uh, those samples um, uh, correspond to a shallower depth of partial melting. So I go quickly over this. So cumulus apatite can also record the fractional crystallization of plagioclase. So on both diagram, it's a European anomaly in apatite and the strontium over yttrium in apatite. And you all know that there is an increase in weros and yttrium in, in the melt with differentiation, and also strontium and europium are affected by plagioclase crystallization. So on both diagram, you can see an evolution, so a decrease in the ratio and europium anomaly in apatite with plagioclase fractionation. And depending on the time of um, apatite crystallization, the starting point will be higher or lower. So now you also know that in mafic layered intrusion, we can use several minerals to say that there is magma mixing. So for example, plagioclase, clinoperoxine, or olivine. So, so this has been done by Olivier Namur in SETI layered intrusion. So this line corresponds to the melt evolution. And when it's, it's going up, it means that there is a magma replenishment. Um, what's important is that at the top of MCU2, we know that there is no magma mixing. And here, we know that there is magma mixing. So we analyzed apatite at different depths in both units. So here it's the depths, and here it's the reverse content in apatite and vanadium content in apatite. So if you first look at MCO2, where we know there is no magma mixing, there is an increase in reverse and a decrease in vanadium with fractional crystallization. But when you look at MCO1, where we know there is magma mixing, at first it evolves the same. But when there is magma mixing, you see a decrease in reverse and an increase in vanadium. So apatite can also be used to say there is magma mixing in mafic layered intrusion. And at last, um, we can also we could also use apatite to uh, as a provenance indicator. So first, we need to know if apatite crystallizes from a mafic or a felsic melt. So we tested the diagram I produced in a previous work. So um, it separates. Uh, apatite crystallizing from mafic melts and apatite crystallizing from felsic melts. So all the samples I showed you before all plot in the mafic field. So that's right. And now we need to know if apatite from this mafic melt can be associated with iron titanium phosphorus mineralization, so cumulus apatite, or if apatite may be associated, intercumulus apatite may be associated with nickel copper PG mineralization. So again, we tested the diagram we produced before, and all cumulus apatite share, uh, have a, a distinct signature from intercumulus apatite. So this is important because we want to know um, if we may have uh, iron titanium phosphorus mineralization or nickel copper PG mineralization. So that's all I had to say about apatite for today. So just uh, as a take home message, 
Apatite can be very useful as a petrogenetic indicator because it can trace several processes other minerals or whole work analysis can trace. And also there is a huge potential to use detrital apatite as an indicator mineral for exploration. So thank you for, it, for your attention. Very much, and thank you for keeping so well to time. Uh, any questions? Yes. Thanks. I'm intrigued. How do you reconcile things like the the strontium isotope ratio side of things with an elemental chemistry that doesn't seem to support crustal contamination, solicit crustal contamination? Rubidium concentration would not typical of solicit crust. Worry that what's taking single parameters, possibly it's the full concentration. Okay. I don't really I don't really know what to say about this. <laughs> no, that's perfectly okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe something to reflect for. Any other questions? I, I was interested in, in the vanadium uh, trends that you showed. And I was just also wondering whether or not um, you could also interpret some of those changes as a result of changes in the redox state of a, of a magma because appetite can also take up the four plus cation substituting for phosphorus. And so there could be changes in the redox chemistry of the magma in addition to just influx of new primitive magma. Yeah, in fact, I only showed uh, vanadium, but it's also working for other elements, such as magnesium or, or strontium. So that's why we suppose it's due to magma mixing, but that's true. There may be an effect on um, of uh, FO2, but we didn't constrain it for, uh, for this. So that's true. <laughs> Arsenic is another element that would be subject to that as well, because it can also substitute, substitute for phosphorus in the four, four plus or five plus state, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I think just as a final point, I just I should just ask if there are any questions online. <clears throat> so I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, I assume there are no questions, which means that it's time for our tea break. She's in the same place where the, where the icebreaker was. <laughs>